you ever purchased a, a tub of popcorn and gone to the counter and they said, oh, wait, now it's $15 instead of the $13 <laughs> that I was really going to charge you. And now the tub of popcorn is a lot smaller. Welcome to the Business of Betting Podcast. I am Jason Trost. What is up, everybody? Uh, I'm joined today by David Purdom. Um, if you are at all interested in sports betting in the United States, you will have come across some of his content. He's been there from the beginning and I think before the beginning of uh, the, the nascent industry. I'm really excited to have him on. He's seen everything from the legalization to the uh you know just giant explosion of commercial opportunity in this industry um so i think he's had as close of a front row view to this industry as anybody in the united states and uh obviously i'm i'm very much looking forward to getting his perspective perspective on things so david first of all welcome to the podcast thanks for having me jason yeah, so we've we've talked off and on for years, but I've always been, you know, your Twitter feed ha throughout the years has been one of the most interesting places for me to go to kind of stay up on on all the events. So why don't why don't we just do a quick uh, stroll down memory lane? Why don't you give people um, a little bit of background, um, how you got into sports betting, the sports betting beat, and uh, yeah, what brought you to this industry? Yeah. I, I lucked into it right around 2008. Um, I was a uh, sports writer for the Atlanta Journal Constitution at the time, uh, just here in Atlanta. I was covering everything from traditional uh, high school sports, college sports, professional sports. Um, at the time, as you probably know, the American uh, newspaper industry was going down quickly, uh, really having some struggles. And just recently, Atlanta Journal Constitution announced that they're going to stop print editions. It's going to be only online. So. Um, we were having lots of layoffs at the time. So I said, you know what, uh, I was getting ready to have a baby. I'm going to start freelancing to kind of, uh, you know, check things out, make sure I'm in. And I stumbled onto writing about sports betting and it was $25 a story at a site called covers.com that anybody that uh, follows the U S industry probably is familiar with. And it was basically, you know, uh, previews of sec football with the, with the point spreads included or whatever like that. And so it, it, it was really started as nothing, but when I started writing about it, I really found out that I, 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 uh, loved some of the stories and characters that came out of it. Um, so I kind of embraced it and started writing more and more and more about it. And sooner or later, um, I was able to transition out of traditional uh, sports media and into sports betting alone. Um, I eventually worked at a place called Line Makers Sporting News. Uh, more mainstream uh, sites started coming and covering sports betting um, because when I started at the time, you and I talked about this, it was basically only uh, touts, only pick sellers, guys uh, selling, you know, picks. That's that's who wrote about sports betting, and it was all uh, picks. There wasn't any kind of stories about the business of betting. Um, so I, I kind of lucked into that niche, and I landed at ESPN thanks to Chad Millman, uh, who is now the Action Network. Um, in 2014, it was right in the heart of uh, the New Jersey's quest to try to get sports betting through the legalization process, through the courts. Um, and so I was kind of lucky to have started as that court case began. I got to follow that all the way through, and it eventually led to where we are today uh, after a Supreme Court decision in 2018 kind of opened the floodgates for all these states to get involved. Back in 2014, did you think that it had legs, or did you just think it was another failed attempt uh, to repeal PASPA? Yeah. Well, it'd been, you know, it's first started in 2008 and we had gone over and over and over and lost and the, the New Jersey lost at this court and lost at this court and appealed and lost again, this and this, that yeah. it went over. So it was kind of feeling that way um, that, gosh, this is never going to get done. And I remember when they lost in the, it was the third circuit court of appeals in, in Philadelphia. And this is, gosh, I think April of 2014, if I'm like, right around the spring of 2014. And uh, some of the guys that were covering her and I were both like, I think that's it. That's it. And then a week later, uh, they decide to announce a complete new bill and repeal all sports betting laws. So there was no going to be no laws. And they said, if there's no laws, we can do whatever. 
And that really started a whole other thing. People kind of rolled their eyes at it. But that eventually showed that uh, the law that was in place, the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act, it's called PASPA, uh, that it was invalid and inconstitutional. And the Supreme Court uh, eventually took that case um, from that vile effort of just to decriminalize everything um, and voided uh, PASPA. And that's what got us to this point. So, no, I did not think that it, I thought it was over <laughs> at, at some point. I think I shared that view. I mean, I, I was, I was, uh, I was always based in London and so, you know, kind of keeping an eye on it, but, uh, I was probably on the skeptical side if that would ever get passed. Cause I remember reading all those articles about New Jersey losing every appeal. It's kind of a funny quirk of the American legal system, how, you know, the Supreme court didn't do anything per se on sports betting, uh, except invalidate some 1992 law. And, uh, that's sort of, what, it's such a, it's such a funny quirk about, uh, about the Supreme Court, how it works like that. That's what happened in Roe versus Wade. They didn't make, um, in Roe versus Wade repeal, they didn't, or whatever the new case is, um, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, mm -hmm. They didn't say that abortion was illegal. They That's said it. the the uh, concept that the, the that the abortion is protected by the constitution doesn't hold anymore. And then the states are open to do what they want to do with their laws, which is what happened in sports betting. So one of exactly. my pet issues is, and maybe I'm just uh, talking into the wind a little bit, but one of my pet issues is I think America would have been so much better served um, if it were done federally. Do you, do you share that opinion or do you think it doesn't matter that much? No, I, I do share that opinion. And this patchwork of, of state laws that we have, you know, you can bet on certain colleges in this state, you can't bet uh, college props in this state. Uh, it's very difficult and challenging for the operators to uh, find it. And again, you know, you and I've also talked about the Wire Act, which prevents uh, states going, uh, bets coming across state lines. And that really kind of coffins you into a, an individual state and, and it makes it very challenging. So I've actually been mentioning that to a few of, of the operators lately who are all, you know, adamantly against a federal approach to begin with. And nobody wanted that. Everybody wanted to be left up to the states and that's how it is. But now with all the challenges that come with trying to abide by the individual regulations that each state have put together, it's become challenging. And, you know, for it's become challenging to comply with all the different regulations. And, I, you know, people have gotten fined because, oh, we had Rutgers up in New Jersey on accident because we've had them up everywhere else. And it was just kind of part of our system and that we shouldn't have had those up. And, you know, you can fault them for for, for not uh, taking the steps required to be in compliance. But at the same time, it just seems kind of silly uh, for that yeah. to be something that you have to pay attention to. And, and that's what happens. So in that case, I do think federal uh, regulation would be good. I also think that federal regulation would maybe increase the barriers to entry a little bit. Um, I am scared that sometimes they're getting a little lower and people are uh, going around some of the laws and some of the uh, responsible gambling practices that need to be put in place. Um, so while we want a free competitive market, we also want people to be in the market that are responsible and can handle the uh, requirements to, to participate in this market. Out of curiosity, that's an interesting perspective. Why do you think federal uh, regime would make it um, lower their barriers to entry vis-a-vis -vis responsible gambling? Like, why do you think that would be laxer? I think, no, no, I think it'd be the other way. I think it, it would take the bar entry bar up a little bit. Um, oh, I, so I, I and right you're now, in favor yeah, of that. I think now the state regulations yeah. um, are, are not as strict as some of them. I mean, some states yeah. legalize sports betting and did not dedicate any funds to uh, problem gambling. And I just think, I'm yeah. like, what? How, how could you possibly do that? Of course you need to, you know, dedicate some of the funds to help the people that uh, are unable to to control their gambling. And for states mm -hmm. not to do that, I just think that's completely irresponsible on their end. And a federal statute that would require that would help. Yeah, absolutely. I would just, I would just say, um, uh, that it's uh, you were saying an open market. It's really not an open market because you have to get in most states. You have to get licenses with casinos, um, which, in my opinion, have nothing to do with sports betting. So I think it's quite a it's quite a it's almost sure. like a cartel in a way. You know, some states are better than others. You know, Colorado is a, one of better state because there's more 
quote unquote airport slots um, for operators, but states like Pennsylvania that only or New York that only have a handful. Um, and, and when you have to go through a casino, I think it's quite uh, restrictive. I think it's really important to, to, you know, like if you're not from this industry or looking from the outside in, you, you might think like, oh, it's good to have regulation. It's good to have these licenses. And that is totally the case. But ultimately, the big loser, if you make the regulation too complicated um, and expensive, the, it prevents small startups from getting into the space and then the consumers will have less choice ultimately. So as somebody that has been really involved and I guess you saw this sort of, you know, the, the whole evolution of the state court, the, the state, the state, you know, New Jersey going against the Supreme court and all these kinds of things. Do you think there's ever a window for federal mm. legislation or is that ship sailed? <laughs> it is very, very difficult to get anything done in Congress yeah. these days, uh, making sports betting a priority to get something through certainly not yeah. going to happen anytime soon. Uh, will maybe do we get a relaxation of the wire act or a better uh, defining of it so people yeah. know exactly what is allowed there's been debates over commas uh, actual commas in in that language in that legislation so maybe we get some sort of clarification on that widespread federal leg legislation in, on sports betting uh no I, I i don't see that happening certainly anytime soon and my opinion has changed on that a little bit i thought that some at some point we would get some sort of federal uh, input in, or we had a couple bills drafted uh, and sent around and they just never got any kind of traction. So uh, right now, if I had to put an over under on, you know, 10 years, I would probably take the over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So what are some of the things that have surprised you in, uh, in the development of sports betting in the U S a bunch. Um, a lot happened as uh, I kind of thought would happen. Some of the major media companies getting involved and so forth. Um, but some of the biggest surprises have been the leagues, you know, full throated pivot on this. Um, they went from just absolute over the top rhetoric during the court case. Uh, Bud Steele, former Major League Baseball commissioner, came out and said that, you know, gambling would be the death of all sports and just. It's way over the top rhetoric. And then for them to completely, you know, 360 degree turn all the way around and be embracing sports betting as they are. We have sports books at stadiums now. Arizona Cardinals just opened one just outside of their stadium. Uh, we have at baseball, we have one at Nationals Park. There's getting ready to be one at Wrigley Field. Uh, there's a sports book inside Capital One Arena in Washington, D.C. Uh, so just that uh, complete flip. Uh, by the sports leagues, uh, you know, they had, they were going to pivot, right? They, were, they knew they, there was money involved. They wanted the legalization to happen. Uh, so when it did, they, they were going to pivot. But just for as someone who followed it and listened to them tell me how awful it was that this was going on and how much damage it was going to do, and then for them all the way to flip, that was, uh, that's always been pretty shocking to me. But uh, I guess the second thing I would notice is, is the betting habits of the younger generation. This is probably more me being a dinosaur than anything, but, uh, you know, I like to bet uh, pregame point spread and sit there and watch the game, and that's, I root for it. Now, guys are betting throughout the game, uh, live, and there's so much more on player props, betting on individual players more than they are teams. Um, it's been really amazing to watch. I mean, just this football game here uh, on Monday night, uh, Javante Williams, the Denver Broncos running back. There were more bets on him just to score a touchdown than any time touchdown market that's become very popular than there were on Seattle to cover the spread. Uh, the Super Bowl last year at points bet, uh, there were more bets on Cooper Cup, the Rams receiver, to, to score a touchdown than there were uh, on either side of the point spread. So uh, it's really just amazing how much um, the younger generation of bettors are gravitating uh, to player props. So that's been kind of surprising to me. One of the things that uh, that that I think will be interesting over the next 10, 20 years is that the format of, if you want to stick with American football, you know, each game is three or four hours long, you know, our society and, and community, you know, our lives keep getting faster and faster. You know, when I was a kid, you had nothing to do on the weekend besides watch football game. But, well, if you weren't playing sports, but watch football games for three or four hours, no problem. But now I find myself, I like almost have to watch an American football game on recording just so I can 
get through the ads and, you know, try to get a football game in under an hour. So do you, I mean, from my perspective, I think that the, the, the prop betting is more of a, you know, it's kind of more akin with, um, you know, something that you can dip in and dip out of, uh, rather than committing to, you know, the three or four hour game. If you're betting, betting on the spread, you have to wait until the final whistle before that, you know, what happens. But if you're, if you're betting on this running back to score a touchdown, then, you know, once he scores it, you're, you can go off with your day. What do you think that's the case? Or do you think that spread betting is boring and there's something more intrinsically interesting in prop bets? What, what do you think the reason is? I think it's fantasy sports. I, I think the just younger generation uh, before legalization, they grew up playing fantasy football. That was the only way that they could invest money uh, in sports it w- was to play fantasy football. And so they mm. learned to handicap player performances more than they did team performances. And, uh, you know, I don't know if the, um, the quickness, the speediness of, of maybe having the, those bets um, resolved if a guy scores a touchdown in the first quarter or, or that much part of it, because he may not score and you have to hang in there to the fourth quarter to see if he does. Uh, I think it always kind of keeps you in, in, involved. But when I look at it, it really comes down to fantasy sports. Uh, this, uh, If you were younger than 21 before 2018, that was the only way that you really had at least, um, unless you went outside and played offshore or found a local bookmaker, um, that was the only way you had a chance to invest in money was was, was play fantasy sports and uh, mm. the rise of daily fantasy sports uh, in 2015, 16 uh, really kind of set that uh, off, in my opinion. And now we see that those companies, FanDuel and DraftKings, that were the prominent daily fantasy operators. Now they're the largest sports books here in the U.S. Mm. Yeah, that's inter- do do uh, do fantasy yourself, or or you two uh, quote unquote dinosaur for that? <laughs> I did fantasy for a long time. I finally got tired of it because it was too conflicting with my bets. Right, I would be rooting for Denver <laughs> to score a touchdown or to cover the spread, but then I'd have the Green Bay quarterback or whatever in my fantasy league, and uh, it just got too too much to keep track of. I, I really am the most simplistic, awful better there is. Uh, uh, on my Twitter bio, it kind of says it all. I, I write about sports betting, but I am not good at sports betting at all. Uh, you know, I, I, I am what you call a fish or whatever. Uh, instead of betting maximums, I bet minimums. And, and I, you know, for fun. Are you a nickel slots guy? No, nah, I don't play any slots, really. I'll play some black. Game, but uh, I like to have some sort of feel of strategy rather than uh, being able to just yeah. pull the lever when I don't have any strategy. I like to be able to make a choice. Yeah. Absolutely. So as, as somebody who's been a long time observer f- from the industry, what are your hopes uh, for the direction things go? Do you, do you, are there features or different things that you think the industry should be doing? Well, uh, you'll probably like to hear this, but I, I do hope that uh, exchanges take off here in the U S I think they're a very good uh, complementary piece of any market. Um, we've had uh, a, a lot of uh, pushback from savvy bettors who have gotten limited uh, by sports books to ridiculous amounts. Um, I think that exchanges will help that cause. Um, I also think that they can help uh, recreational players like myself uh, to go on there. And even if I place a small letter, I'm probably getting better odds. And so that will increase the life expectancy of my bankroll, even though that I, I, it's probably going away at some point, uh, (laughs) but it it will, it will last a little longer. And um, that's something that I'd really like to see the industry take hold of, uh, take ownership of is the practice of of limiting uh, betters who win. Um, I don't think that is appropriate. I understand it's their business. I see their side of it. They want to make as much money as possible, like any business does. However, you cannot come out here and tell me how you were reacting, uh, how important being a responsible operator and taking care of responsible gambling initiatives are if you are reducing anybody's chances that have win to win, and then you're left with this pool of losing betters and losing betters. Uh, that has the highest percentage of, of problem gamblers, correct? I mean, obviously. So if you're doing that and you're now you're all your marketing is targeting these pool of losing betters. And I just think there's a better way to go about it. I don't know if anybody's ever figured it out yet, but uh, it's been too heavy handed, in my opinion, when you get uh, guys going in there and they try to place a bet and 
the wind, the spin, the spinning wheel, they call it, and it pauses for them. And all of a sudden it comes back and moves the odds and offers a lesser amount that they can bet. So uh, there are some real issues I have with that. I just think that is unethical to the, to the bone. And I hope these companies can step up and, and try to be better about that. So, uh, I have a lot of thoughts on this and I tend to agree with you that it's unethical, but to talk from the bookmaker's side, well, I'll give you the bookmaker side uh, mm -hmm. perspective and argue their case in a second. But like, just like, do you think that there should be no limits? Like, if somebody wants to bet a million pounds on this, a million dollars on the spread, should they be allowed to do that? Or do you think if it's reasonable, like a thousand dollars, like that's cool, and like let's move on? Do, do like where are you in the ethical boundary on that? On that? That I think there should be minimum bet liabilities posted. You have to post that we will take up to a. $500 win on an NFL market right now. Okay. I know that, that everybody always says, well, they're just going to make it be $5. I, I think we can be a little more sophisticated than that and complex and come up with some sort of thing. But that's the problem. If you don't post your limits and tell people how much they can get down, it, it, it makes it a, a fool's game. Uh, I'm if, if I were a good better and I was influential in the market and I came in there and wanted to get a few hundred dollars down, and you limit me to $50, well, I've just now given you my information. You just stole my intellectual property and you're using it to impact your business by changing your odds. Mm -hmm. So I, I think uh, there's a sports book in Las Vegas, Circa Sports. Uh, they post their, their their limits, betting limits uh, on the site. And now, you know, I, I do believe that sports books should be allowed to offer perks to VIPs, right? Okay, we'll give you extended limits and things like that. But I just don't think you should be able to not post a, what a minimum bet limit should be uh, that you will allow. And okay, so let, let's say it was five hundred dollars, and mm -hmm. I'm a winning punt, a winning better. Do you think like is it okay for the bookmaker to limit me to bet a thousand? Like if I want to bet twice, is, do you think that that's okay? If as long as they've given me the five hundred, that's cool. Or do you think that it should go forever? Um. If you move the line, then yeah. you should be allowed to bet again. If the line is the same, then you've got your limit at that price. You 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 have uh, expended your limit at that price. Now, if I'm, there's a new price offered, um, you're allowed to wager it again at that. Um, mm. But um, if it is at that one price, and I think you've met your limit, then that's that's the limit, right? That, that's mm. how much you can bet at this price. So to, to, to defend the bookmakers, which I don't like doing very much, but to defend the bookmakers, the, f the first thing to realize is pretty much everybody is losing money hand over fist in the United States. So if yes. you take all the big providers, they're losing between one to $2 million per day, one to $2 million per day. So even if you have all these people losing and the win winners are limited, they're, they're losing money like crazy. Um, I think it's not a secret that that's not, a long-term strategy that's kind of a land grab strategy and and but i think the the truth remains that it remains to be seen if the bigger players in the united states um have a business model that that uh generates cash um the second thing is the the operating overhead of these businesses is enormous so even though that these guys are making like five six percent per trade which to me is insane um, my first job, I was a stock trader and my boss, you know, beat into my head, like never pay the spread, uh, the bid offer spread and like everything matters. Everything's around the price. And to find out that the transaction fee, if you like, of a sports bet in the United States starts at 5%. It's just, to me, it's madness. But even with the 5% model, these guys employ thousands of people. They, uh, the marketing is hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Um, it's, it remains to be seen if they built the right mousetrap that uh, can profitably uh, keep these people. Certainly, FanDuel and DraftKings were losing money in the fantasy days. Like FanDuel and DraftKings have never made money, um, which is why they, they were looking at uh, uh, doing the merger before the DOJ broke that up. So, I think so. To defend the bookmaker that they're losing money hand over fist with by blocking winners, right? And so, if you if you open the floodgates, so to speak. Um, to winners, uh, you know, they're, they're, they might not be able to be a going, you know, they might have no business left. So how that's many winners are there? What percentage are there? How many are there? The, so here's the thing about, so I think I have to check on smart markets, but it, like we have a huge percentage of our population that is, has a net positive, uh, balance. 
uh, I should check, but I want to say it's like at least, I'm not going to say, but it's a big number. And, um, but the issue with, uh, winners is that, uh, so th there's basically two concepts that make it hard to, to market make sports. There's the concept of information asymmetry, which is a very fancy way to say, if I know something that you don't, I can monetize right. that information. Um, and the second concept is called adverse selection, which basically is a, another fancy concept that says all things being equal, you're more likely to get filled when you're wrong than when you're, you're more likely to get a trade when you're wrong than when you're right. And so if you think about, you know, the bookmaker's job is to have a price 24 hours a day across 15, 16 sports, and depending on the sport and the market, all that kind of stuff, offer bets between five and say 500 different things at any given time. So the winning punter, the one that has information advantage, uh, only has to be right once. Uh, and the, you know, the bookmaker only has to be wrong once to lose money. Mm -hmm. And in cases of information asymmetry, uh, it's rampant in sports. It's rampant in sports. Like there is no insider trading law in sports betting. So if I know that Troy Aikman is injured, I don't, I don't know, showing my age thing, <laughs> I don't know if the kids know who Troy Aikman is anymore. But if Troy Aikman is injured and I know that before anybody else, then uh, then obviously I can monetize that. And that's legal to do. It's the same. It's the same. It's a little bit like the same concept of card counting. Fundamentally, card counting is legal. Um, right. and gives you an edge. And if I know that Troy Aikman or whatever star quarterback is injured before the bookmaker does, I can crush the bookmaker. And so the bookmaker is, uh, I mean, the way that the most of the industry does it, at least in the UK and the US, is they, they limit the winners to help protect them against that. So just to throw that back to you, how does that sit with you in this, from this perspective of like, I think it's unethical to cap the knees of the, the winners. How do you feel about that? Well, um, what I just said? Well, I, I think that from my understanding and from studies that have been undertaken that, you know, it's, it's a very small percentage of accounts here in the U S that win very, very small. We're mm -hmm. talking under 10%. Um, mm -hmm. so letting those people, uh, win, I don't think is going to crush anybody's bottom line. I really don't. I, you know, there'll be guys that take advantage of them and there always are, um, that exploit, um, maybe an information advantage or they exploit, uh, bad odds, um, palps as you guys call them over there. Um, and that, that is always a concern. And I can see how, if somebody acts that in that manner, that you would want to limit them. But if these guys are coming in and they are betting, um, again, a, a, a live bet or even a pregame bet, and you are taking their action, putting on pause, reviewing it, and then moving your odds and offering them less, that's bait and switch. There, there's no, there is it's absolutely bait and switch. You have offered the Cowboys at three, uh, you'd have no limits. You put up $500 and you come back to them and say, nope, we're gonna move the line to three and a half and we'll give you a hundred dollars on that. Mm -hmm. that. That should not be allowed. And that is where we are right now. This is happening way too often by licensed sports books in the US. And that is ripping people off. That is ripping their uh, intellectual property from them. So uh, I, I just think that has to, has to change. And I don't know how it can other than uh, regulators getting involved and their regulators are making money from the industry. So uh, it, 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 there's no easy answer. I, I, and I understand that the sports books um, want to make money, but what, what do you think the sports books are marketing? What, what, what would you, when you say they market, what are sports books selling or marketing? They're marketing entertainment. I think they're marketing hope, hope of winning and mm -hmm. they're marketing it, mm -hmm. but they're not offering it really because they're cutting you off before you can have that hope. And if you mm -hmm. do the things that it takes to win, um, you know, it, it, you get cut off and that's just, it's an ugly spot of the industry and it really irks me when they talk about all this, uh, how much they are committed to responsible gambling. And then they're taking this practice of funneling down their client base to only losing betters and all their marketing is targeting them. I think that, um, I agree with you that there's unethical behavior going on. It's sort of akin to this, um, idea of front running in the financial industry. So front running mm -hmm. is when you're a broker and, and you see a, a, a winning stock trader placing a bet and you go place that bet in front of them. Right. Uh, it's sort of akin to that. 
But because everybody thinks about sports betting like an entertainment industry, nobody thinks to put financial style regulation on it. And, you know, this is the whole problem with when you, when regulators make you do a deal with a casino, like sports betting is closer to NASDAQ than it is Mohegan Sun. I mean, sure. if you think about sports betting, besides the fact it's sort of culturally lumped in this kind of like ethereal idea of gambling, sports betting really has nothing to do with casino. Like they're completely different, uh, you know, they're different, they're different uh, activities completely like the, Spinning a roulette wheel has nothing to do with uh, player prop bet. Um, right. And so I think it's been a giant mistake uh, to do this with casinos. But my point is that the whole industry is built around this idea that it's more like a movie ticket rather than a stock trade. So if you treat it like a movie ticket, you know, nobody, you know, nobody stops uh, Cineworld from charging you like $13 for a popcorn. You know, it's kind of the same idea. Like if you treat the gambling industry, the sports betting industry, like, um, like an entertainment industry, you're not going to think about it like a financial transaction and you're not going to regulate it like a uh, financial transaction. You ever purchased a, a tub of popcorn and gone to the counter and they said, Oh wait, now it's $15 instead of the $13 that I was really <laughs> going to charge you. And now the tub of popcorn is a lot smaller. No, but if you, so just, I can't, I, I cannot believe I'm until I'm taking the side <laughs> of the, the bookmakers right now, but, uh, it would be more like if I'm buying a used car and you're selling a used car for $10,000 and I could show up with $10,000 cash, but you can tell I'm really want this car, you know, right. like. And if, you know, if you're if a smart business person, you might be like, well, I got other offers that just came in, like, but I can. I can do this for 12. It's kind of sim more similar to that. And so you could argue that that's unethical, but you could also argue it's a little bit uh, supply and demand uh, dynamics going on. It's a tough, I, I, nobody's ever solved it. And, you know, people always say, why don't we go to the uh, high volume, low margin model, uh, the pinnacle model is what we call it here in, in the US for a long time. And my always response to that is that, well, if there's what one pinnacle, uh, you know, maybe, 10 books across the world, maybe 20, I, I don't know, but a very small percentage of have gone with that model compared to how many have gone with the recreational, the DraftKings fan dual models and, and, and yeah. so forth. And there's probably a reason for that, right? It, it is more successful uh, business model proven over time until we get a uh, massive, massive volume established to the market matures and we'd have to have some serious consolidation uh, among sports books and that would, would take away some of uh, the consumer opportunities. So um, I certainly, and I've been in your shoes trying to defend the bookmakers as, as well because they want to make money. And I, I guess the other, other point is I want to make is the bets that they're offering the sports book is, is, is not the losing thing, right? It's their marketing and the, the, the net profit on the bets are still there, millions and millions of dollars each month. But uh, uh, the, the marketing and the overhead costs of running this business um, are, are what's causing them to take a loss. So, you know, is that in that on them to figure out their business model a little better uh, and instead of uh, doing unethical things towards their consumers? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, uh, I mean, you're, you're, you're striking on one of my nerves here and you know, I, I've been, I mean, indeed why I founded Smarkets and, and why I got into this industry, you know, I came at this from stock trading mm -hmm. and I thought it was madness that people pay 5% transaction fees. Like, you know, people pay that when they buy a house, but you know, to do like a, just a normal trade, you know, imagine going to an ATM and every time you withdraw a hundred bucks, you have to pay five bucks. It's just right. it's such a, it's so expensive. Um, and it just blows my mind. I think the real issue with sports betting is there's just not enough innovation. And that's because the, the barriers to entry are too high. In fact, I think the, uh, between the, the compliance, the, uh, getting licensed and, and it's just got infinite, you know, it's infinitely worse in the United States with this whole casino playing the role of the gatekeeper, um, bit. It's very expensive. Just like table stakes are incredibly expensive. Sure. And while you want to, it's very true. You want to protect the consumer. You want to protect vulnerable betters. And that's very, very important. There are ways to do it without crazy amounts of legislation. And I think that, um, it's just, it's just too expensive to get into this industry. And so you don't get the, uh, 
you know, if you think of all the like classic American B two C uh, startups that have just crushed it, they all started as small companies. And if you look mm -hmm. at most betting companies, they mostly started as they were already big established companies already. There's very few startups in this in this industry, and I think that's why ultimately it's still pretty much a backwards industry. It's still high margin. It's still clunky. The interfaces haven't changed very much in years. And uh, I think it'll stay that way, unfortunately, for a while, uh, while the American market settles out, just because it's it's too complicated to enter it. You know, if I want to do a competitor to TikTok or, you know, just build a social media company, um, I can do that instantly and be in every Google store in the world, every Play Store uh, and App Store in the world tomorrow. You know, I, I, I used to joke with my my business, um, my co-founder that, you know, we should have done WhatsApp. Like WhatsApp was essentially 50 people and you build a chat application and, and that can be live globally tomorrow, you mm -hmm. know, but to do sports betting globally literally is impossible. So you can only do it in X number of states in the United States. So I think some of the, 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 the regulation is, is important, but it, it keeps, ultimately it harms the, the consumer. Do you think it's possible to be a, startup uh, sports book in the US market at this time and, and be viable? Well, there are startups, you know, the uh, sport trade and profit are, you know, new exchanges mm -hmm. that are trying to punch through and I think Jake Paul, today. Or Jake Paul, you know, a few other people, um, you know, it's, it's encouraging to see and I'm very, I'm very happy to see that. And I think the industry totally needs more of that. But you tend to see more of the ESPNs and the fanatics and the you know, those types that are trying to, to get into sports betting. And I'm, I'm like, that just bums the shit out of me, you know, like, <laughs> you know, we need fanatic sports books. Like, you know, like fanatics is great at selling jerseys. Like what, what does that have to do with sports betting? Right. Um, but I really, I really hope so. I, I think it for such a big industry, I think it, it needs a lot of disruption. Um, whether that comes from us or somebody else, I hope somebody figures it out because I think it's, uh, very inefficient industry. And to your point, like, I think they have a, the industry has a lot of bad practices that should be cleaned up. And I think those bad practices, uh, when it's been tied to the casinos, the, the reputation, um, is hurting sports betting at this time, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, that being tied to the casinos is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, in Las Vegas, sports betting for the longest time was looked at as an amenity, uh, for the big casinos. Hey, come in there, spend the weekend, bet on sports, play our table games, have you checked our 25% margin slots, you know, things like this um, for, for now going at it on its own where, you know, there is not that uh, casino. A lot of the places now I would should say are, are adding online casino for that exact reason uh, to get those higher margin games. But uh, I, I think that tying it to casinos and the reputation of the gambling industry uh, that it's had, it, it has been a taboo for the U S for such a long time. And there is a stigma about it. Uh, regardless of how much uh, effort and uh, th that have been made to clean it up and, and do things the right way, uh, that stigma exists. And I think that's why um, you have those high barriers of entries and those casino industry are extremely powerful um, and they can keep uh, startups out or if startups come in and have success, they can acquire them. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it definitely gets funneled up to the top. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Speaking of shady uh, industries, it's been quite interesting to watch Disney uh, make a lot of noises about ESPN getting into sports betting. I don't know. I know you work for ESPN. I don't know if you can comment on that. What do you like? Are you allowed to talk about sports books in ESPN? Or you know, I, I know what's been printed. They do a very good job of keeping me separate um, because I am the reporter. Um, so all my information really comes from what's been told, uh, you know, um, there has been talk of it, uh, no doubt. There have been plenty of reports. Uh, I don't know if ESPN will ever pivot that way. Uh, I, I just don't know. Um, they try to keep, uh, they do a good job of it. Um, they would put me in a, a, a tough spot, right? If, if they started telling, well, this is what we're going to do. And I was like, well, I need to report that. And no, you can't report that. So uh, they do a good job of that. So the only thing I really know has been what's reported. And certainly there are discussions uh, ongoing and have been for a long time. So it'll be uh, interesting to see the other media companies that have jumped in. Um, you know, NBC is real uh, a, a partner with PointsBet, and they've really integrated it on there. Fox has its own sports book. Um, I just don't know if uh, are those 
media companies making that much money off the sports books. It's a, a again, a low margin business, right? Or how much could they possibly expect to make from taking a percentage from a low margin of business? Um, but it happens again and again and again, and it continues. I'd say it's a high margin business, but high margin business. <laughs> really? If you're making 5% for a database transaction, sure, sure, database sure. transaction, that's pretty good. Uh, I don't know. And some of the whole percentage has been crazy. Uh, I saw a double digit host percentage um, for August, I believe, in, in New Jersey books. So that, 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 that's yeah. really been crazy. But uh, yeah, I, I'm not trying to blow you off, but I really, they, they do a good job of keeping me separate uh, away from the discussions about the business and the sports betting. Okay. So ignore that you work at ESPN. If somebody that's been around the industry, is that something you're excited about? Like, do you, do you want big media properties, uh, e.g., uh, you know, Disney to get into sports betting? Like, do you think they'll bring a fresh voice or do you think it'll be another me too? Kind of uh, thing? I'm like you, I, you know, fanatic sports book. What, what, how are they going to differentiate themselves? And, uh, you know, sometimes me being the dinosaur that I am, do I really need that much differentiation? Uh, yeah. I see these giant, giant, massive menus of derivatives and alternate lines, and just all this kind of things. And then I hear the books complain about when somebody finds a loophole or, or exploits a bad number in those things. And I'm just like, whoa. Why are you even offering it? Are you really making that much money off over under Draymond Green rebounds in a first quarter or whatever it is? And I, the, so the answer is I, yes. Are they really? You think they're really yeah, making the, that much? The money? reason is the transaction fee is way higher than five percent on those things. And those so props, the props will have transaction fees of like 10, 20, 30 percent. So that's why you, in New Jersey you might see holds that are up at you know low single digits because they're either doing parlays or these kind of exotic bets and every parlay and every exotic bet i would say i would be shocked if they had under a 10 percent transaction oh yeah margin so, parlays are way up there so that's that's why they're they're offering all those things um and, and then, people want them if you are offering them you can't uh get all up in arms if uh, somebody finds a, a a mistake in in your in your lines right i mean you, you got the menu up there that's the wager you're offering as long as it's not egregious error, a, a 20 point favor being listed as a 20 point underdog, you know, tighten up your stuff. If you can't, you can't get it together. Don't, don't offer so much. You just got to sp put it the spinning wheel and fix it and then put yeah. it back. And then, there, then you there you go. There you go. Offer a different <laughs> price. Uh, so yeah, uh, the, the, I think over in the UK, um, our, our friend Alan Bowden, he always talks about how that is never really the com combination of sports books and media companies. I've never really done much for him or had that much overall success, really. Well, I think it's, well, you, you sort of had the example of Sky. That might be the one uh, exception where, you know, Sky mm -hmm. is a sports book and also the, the media company owned by the Murdochs, or at least used to be owned by the Murdochs. Um, the reason you don't is because uh, sports betting in the UK came out of a legacy of bookshops. So Bet365, Betfred. Uh, Patty Power, William Hill, Ladbrokes, all the Coral, uh, all these names that that are brand names in the UK used to be uh, uh, bookshops that people walked into, and and mm -hmm. so they sort of had the market already kind of built up, and and there hasn't been that many newcomers in the sports betting. The only major newcomer in sports betting in the UK has really been Betfair. Um, they really took the scene by storm in the early two thousands, and then kind of. Uh, migrated into being more of a, a Me Too sports book. Um, but Betfair was one of the few sort of uh, sports betting companies that kind of started from scratch in the UK. Yeah, and they ended up what, partnering with Paddy Power, right? To, to, to they did a merger and model. then, yeah. and now, and now Betfair kind of has become the um, Procter and Gamble of, of sports betting. You know, I think they have like 10, 12, you know, brands now and they're, they're trying to do more of a, a uh, distributed brand strategy rather than um, a Betfair uh, pushing the envelope strategy. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining. Is there any, like if you, if there's one thing you're looking forward to over the next year in sports betting, is there, is there anything particular that you're excited to see how it shakes out? You know, we'll have the Super Bowl in, in Arizona this year, and that will be the first uh, Super Bowl held at a, a location with a sports book. Um, so I think that will be interesting to see, uh, just how uh, embracing uh, the NFL is of that scene. Um, I'm hoping to be there just to kind of see what the sports book, uh, 
at his NFL stadium during the Super Bowl is like. I've been to Vegas for Super Bowls for years, and it's just an amazing scene. Uh, I'll be interested to see what it seems like that. So just the continued uh, embrace uh, of sports betting by the Sports League will be something I continue to follow. I'm uh, I'm really curious how the in-person sports books go because in the UK they've had them for years right. and they're 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 more like they're more kind of like people use them of course but it's more to like have a little bit of fun it's like going to the track and you kind of get sure. to walk up to the the till but I still like you know I I still don't think see them being that big you know everybody has a phone and you have your account on your phone exactly like, what's uh, the big I'm... deal about uh, you know who wants to talk to a human about sports betting just just go to your phone. And go go to the phone. I've, I've, yeah. But, you know, they have seriously, every uh, state is trying, the, the leagues are legislating, uh, arguing but in their lobbying, I should say, uh, hey, we want to be able to have these sports books at our stadium. So they see some sort of benefit of it. Yeah. Everybody's nostalgic, I guess. There you go. Um, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, I'd love to write a movie or a, a, a TV series at some time. Uh, uh, creative writing is probably uh my favorite part of this aspect of the job and that's what uh, gambling has given me to do is a kind of a muse for that creative writing uh so someday um i would love to 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 write a tv series or even a movie it doesn't even necessarily have to be best based on betting uh probably be since my expertise but uh, nobody's ever really made a good sports betting show because yeah. there's the lacks the visuals right who wants yeah. to see the guy looking at his computer watching lines no but uh, someday maybe we can figure it out. Awesome. Well, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Well, thanks thanks for joining us and giving us your thoughts. And uh, yeah, th it was it was a great conversation. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jake. Good job. All the best.